This is a wrap-up of anatomical structures that form part of the upper respiratory passages with a special emphasis on the structures and features whose weakness or blockage results in snoring. To start with, let's define snoring. Snoring is the vibration of the respiratory structures and resulting sound due to obstructed air movement during breathing while sleeping. Now, let's deal with the anatomical structures that are involved and I will start with the nose. The wall of the nose is made up of movable and immovable parts. The immovable part is bony, the movable part is cartilaginous and is made up of hyaline cartilages. The mobility of the cartilaginous part serves as a partial protection against injury. The alar cartilages dilate or constrict the nares when the muscles acting on the nose contract. The muscles of the nose may provide evidence of breathing behaviors. True nasal breathers can flare their nostrils distinctly. Mouth breathing caused by chronic nasal obstruction diminishes the ability to flare the nostrils. Nose clips, when applied to the nostrils, result in widening by a small amount. This small amount is just enough to allow easier breathing. When you breathe easy, your snoring will reduce significantly. The muscles of the nose are part of the muscles of facial expression. The sphincter muscle is the transverse part of nasalis, also known as compressor nares. This muscle, compressor nares, forms an aponeurosis over the bridge of the nose with its fellow of the opposite side. An aponeurosis is a wide flat tendon. The dilator muscle is the alar part of nasalis, which is also called the dilator nares, and this is inserted into the lateral part of the ala of the nose. It draws the alar cartilages downward and laterally, and so opening the nares. Dilator nares arises from the maxilla below the transverse part. Two additional dilator muscles are the very small depressor septi, which arises from the maxilla above the central incisor and is attached to the nasal septum. The other muscle has a very long name. It's called levator labii superioris elicnesi. The muscle acts on the upper lip, as its name indicates. It arises from the frontal process of the maxilla and inserted into the alar cartilage of the nose. Some fibers are inserted into the upper lip. The dilator mechanism widens the nasal aperture and when obvious in sick infants, it indicates respiratory distress. The nose has a septum called the nasal septum, which divides the nasal cavity into right and left. It is again formed by bone and cartilage movable and immovable part, and it is almost always deviated from the midline. Severe deviation from the midline could result from trauma. Sometimes the deviation is so severe that the nasal septum is in contact with the lateral wall, and therefore it obstructs breathing and exacerbates snoring, and this can be corrected surgically. The cavity of the nose communicates with the exterior through the nostrils, and it opens posteriorly into the nasopharynx through the coeni. The floor of the nose is the roof of the mouth and is formed by the heart palate and the roof of the nose is at the base of the skull. Three nasal conchi, also called the turbinate bones, project from the lateral wall of the nose as shelves. In some persons, the turbinates can be excessively large, resulting in significant nasal obstruction. The conchi increase the respiratory surface of the nose. Beneath each concha is a meatus, and the meatus receives the openings of the four paranasal sinuses in addition to the nasolacrimal duct. The paranasal sinuses are air-filled cavities distributed bilaterally and named according to the bone in which they are located. So we have frontal, ethmoidal, sphenoidal, and maxillary air sinuses. Inflammation of the air sinuses causes a swelling of the mucous membranes inside the nose because they communicate with the nose. Except for the vestibule at the entrance of the nose, which is lined with the skin, the remaining part of the nose is lined by mucosa. The inferior two-third, the nasal mucosa, is called the respiratory area, and the superior one-third is called the olfactory area. This olfactory area contains the peripheral organ of smell. The mucosa of the nose is lined by pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. It has mucus glands that secrete mucus which traps large particles such as dust. 
This mucus is washed towards the pharynx by cilia and then swallowed. Excessive secretion block the nose. In addition, the nasal mucosa has a rich blood supply. That's why nasal bleeds are common. Plus, the mucosa has a submucosal venous plexus, which is an important part of the body's thermoregulatory system, exchanging heat and warming air before it enters the lungs. Swelling of the nasal mucosa occurs readily because of this vascularity, the high vascularity. This swelling of the nasal mucosa results in nasal block during upper respiratory tract infection. Nasal polyps, which are overgrowths of mucosa, may obstruct the nasal cavity as well. Obstruction of the nasal cavity results in snoring and mouth breathing. In the mouth, the tongue has extrinsic and intrinsic muscles. The intrinsic muscles are responsible for changing the shape of the tongue, while the extrinsic muscles alter the position of the tongue as well as its shape. Genioglossus is the bulkiest extrinsic muscle of the tongue. It arises from the mandible. Its fibers fan out to be inserted into the whole length of the tongue. Genioglossus thus protrudes the tongue when it contracts. When genioglossus is paralyzed, the tongue has a tendency to fall posteriorly, obstructing the oropharynx with a risk of suffocation. Total relaxation of genioglossus occurs during general anesthesia. Therefore, an airway is inserted to prevent the tongue from falling back. In unconscious patient, the neck is extended and the chin is lifted. This results in moving the tongue forward and thus opening the airway. Relaxation of genioglossus during sleep may result in obstructive sleep apnea and snoring. Severe retrognathia or deformity of the mandible pushes genioglossus backwards and results in snoring. In mild snoring, sleeping on your side rather than your back prevents the tongue from falling back. Also, avoiding sedatives and alcohol reduces the possibility of weakness of genioglossus. The palate is formed of hard and soft portions. The soft palate hangs from the back of the hard palate and contains muscles and aponeurosis. The uvula is the conical process that hangs from the free margin of the soft palate. During swallowing, the soft palate moves posteriorly against the wall of the pharynx, preventing regurgitation of food into the nasal cavity. This is the function of the soft palate. Swelling or weakness of the soft palate results in narrowing of the airway and snoring. Snoring typically is caused by vibration of the uvula and the soft palate. Surgery can reduce the size of the soft tissue of the uvula and soft palate. Weight reduction might be helpful in mild cases of snoring. The tonsils can be another cause of snoring here. The official name of the tonsils is the palatine tonsils because they extend into the soft palate and because of their relationship to the palatine arches, palatoglossus and palatopharyngeal arches, or folds. Each tonsil lies in the tonsillar fossa of the oropharynx. The tonsils vary in size from person to person. In children, they tend to be large and might result in airway obstruction. Inflammation of the tonsil or development of a peritonsillar abscess may develop and causes airway obstruction. The pharynx is about 12 to 14 centimeter long. It extends from the base of the skull to the inferior border of the cricoid cartilage, which is located just below the Adam's apple. Adam's apple is formed by the thyroid cartilage. The pharynx is wide superiorly, but becomes narrow at the junction with the esophagus. It directs air into the larynx, while solid and liquid food are directed to the esophagus. The pharyngeal wall does not form a complete tube. This is a view of the pharynx from behind, and you can see that it is formed by a musculofacial tube. However, the pharyngeal wall does not form a complete tube. At the top, it opens anteriorly into the nasal cavity and is called the nasopharynx. Lower down, it opens into the mouth and is called the oropharynx. Below, it opens into the larynx and is called the laryngopharynx. Because the pharynx opens anteriorly, 
then the posterior wall of the oropharynx can be seen through the open mouth. The nasopharynx and laryngopharynx can be inspected by using suitably angled mirrors. Let's return to the view of the pharynx from behind. In the nasopharynx, there is a thick fibrous layer which becomes thin at the level of the palate. This thick fibrous layer does not continue downwards into the oropharynx or laryngopharynx because otherwise muscle contraction during swallowing would be impeded if the fibrous layer were properly developed where it overlies the muscles. The thick fibrous layer is called the pharyngobasilar fascia because it's attached superiorly at the base of the skull. This line shows the attachment of the pharyngobasilar fascia to the base of the skull. The stiffness of the pharyngobasilar fascia keeps the nasopharynx always open for breathing. The pharyngobasilar fascia is reinforced posteriorly by a midline thickening called the pharyngeal ligament. The pharyngeal ligament is attached to a tubercle at the basi occiput called the pharyngeal tubercle. Returning back to the musculofacial wall of the pharynx, the muscular layer is composed mainly of three constrictor muscles, superior, middle, and inferior constrictor muscles. They overlap each other from below upwards like three stacked glasses. The muscles do not extend up to the base of the skull. The immovable wall of the nasopharynx here at the base of the skull consists of the thick pharyngobasilar fascia, which makes a fourth cup stacked inside the other three, but it keeps the nasopharynx always open because of the thickness of the fascia and of the fact that there are no muscle fibers to contract. In the oropharynx or laryngopharynx, decreased tone of the pharyngeal muscles that accompanies neurological disease results in easy collapsibility of the pharynx and airway obstruction. You might wonder why air is not sucked into the esophagus during inspiration. It is because the lower part of the inferior constrictor muscle has horizontal fibers that act as a sphincter at the lower extent of the pharynx called the cricopharyngeus muscle. These horizontal fibers of the inferior constrictor muscle are always closed except for swallowing, thus preventing air from being sucked into the esophagus during inspiration. Therefore, air is sucked only into the permanently open trachea through the larynx. The opening of the auditory tube lies in the lateral wall of the nasopharynx. The auditory tube equalizes pressure in the middle ear with the atmospheric pressure. The torus is the prominent rounded lips around the opening of the auditory tube, which is formed of cartilage at this point. The cartilage is trumpet-shaped and is covered by lymphatic tissue, which is called the tubal tonsil. Another tonsil is located nearby and is called the pharyngeal tonsil or the adenoids. This is a collection of lymphatic tissue in the posterior superior wall of the nasopharynx. The pharyngeal, tubal, palatine, and lingual tonsils constitute what is called the Valdyer's ring, which is a defensive ring at the beginning of the respiratory and digestive passages. The nasopharynx has respiratory function, and although it is always kept patent by the pharyngobasilar fascia, an enlarged pharyngeal tonsil can obstruct the passage of air from the nasal cavities and results in mouth breathing and snoring. The oropharynx, unlike the nasopharynx, which has respiratory function, the oropharynx has digestive and respiratory functions. Posteriorly, the wall is formed by the constrictors and it closes completely behind a swallowed bolus. Otherwise, it's open for breathing. Anteriorly in the oropharynx is the posterior third of the tongue and laterally are the two ridges or folds on each side and the palatine tonsil lies in between them so when the tongue falls back in cases of relaxation of genioglossus it obstructs the oropharynx and when the palatine tonsils are enlarged they also result in narrowing of the oropharynx resulting in snoring the larynx trachea and bronchi are stented open by rings of stiff cartilage, hyaline cartilage, in much the same manner as the reinforcements of a vacuum cleaner's hose. These reinforcements in the vacuum cleaner hose, as well as in the larynx, trachea, and bronchi, keep them from collapsing when the vacuum is turned on or when a negative pressure is applied 
during respiration. 